Is Jesus a pleasant hobby for you or an all-consuming passion and obsession? Something you pick up in your spare time or someone who takes up all your time? At the height of popularity, Jesus wants people to know what's involved in being a disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, we're told in Luke 14 and verse 25. Large, not a large crowd, it's plural. Large crowds that were traveling with Jesus. And he turns to them and sets out very clearly the costs of being a disciple. In fact, three times he says, who cannot be a disciple uh, if they don't meet the terms and conditions that he sets out. Well, let's explore what Jesus uh, says about how to be a disciple of Jesus. First of all, you have to come to Jesus. At verse 26, if anyone comes to me, does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. You have to come to Jesus uh, in order to be a disciple. And that does mean coming away from uh, other dearest attachments you come to jesus away from those other attachments that you might have had but you do have to come to jesus christianity is about coming to a person not just coming to church or uh, coming to uh, a, a set of beliefs and doctrines it's about coming to a person and coming with a view to commitment uh, to him and john uh, jesus speaks about that in john chapter 6 after he's fed that uh, large crowd uh, jesus says in john uh, chapter 6 verse 35 i am the bread of life he who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty coming is equivalent to believing and trusting in Jesus. It's not just coming for a, a vague acquaintance. It's coming to trust, to commit, uh, to rely on Jesus. Verse 37 in John 6, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Verse 44 says, no one uh, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Discipleship means coming to Jesus uh, uh, and committing ourselves to him uh, as uh, the master. You've come to church this morning. Have you come to Jesus in your life? and heart it means coming to jesus away from those other dearest att uh, attachments if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother his wife and children his brothers and sisters yes even his own life he cannot be my disciple here are the dearest attachments not just relations, but your own life. How attached are you to your own life? These are our dearest attachments. We've got to be willing to turn our back on them to come to Jesus. And Jesus states it very starkly, doesn't he? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, we might want to tone that down. Oh, well, wait a minute, we'll, we'll qualify it. Uh, and uh, Jesus certainly speaks uh, uh, similarly in uh, Matthew 10, verse 37, where he says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. But Jesus doesn't say that here. He says anyone who doesn't hate his father or mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, it's stark, it's uncomfortable, it's shocking, and it's meant to be. That's why Jesus uses this phrase to this crowd. Don't get an idea that this is a walk in the park, folks, he's telling these people. You've got to get serious. 
we mustn't tone down the impact or soften uh, the power of this with our qualifications. And uh, this is something that's spoken of uh, the tribe of Levi. We had the story earlier uh, of them there in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 33, uh, when Moses is blessing each of the tribes uh, just before they enter the promised land, in Deuteronomy 33 and verse 9, uh, part of his blessing of the tribe of Levi, Deuteronomy 33 verse 9, he said of his father and mother, I have no regard for them. He did not recognize his brothers or acknowledge his own children, but he watched over your word and guarded your covenant. For the Levites, God was first. To the disregard of their parents. Uh, to not recognizing or acknowledging brothers, uh, children. Uh, William Hendrickson says, it's the type of loyalty that is so true and unswerving that every other attachment, even that to one's own life, must be subjected to it. Lord, be my vision supreme in my heart. Bid every rival give way and depart you've sung it i've sung it do we mean it lord be my vision supreme supreme in my heart bid every rival give way and depart uh, remember caleb thinking of the israelites uh, in the land uh, he uh, uh, was promised that uh, mountain because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Wasn't partial, wasn't part time, wholehearted devotion uh, to God. Jesus is calling for wholehearted devotion to Him. The uh, pastor of the early reign church in China, uh, a house church in uh, 2018. He prepared a statement. Uh, uh, if he was arrested and not released within 48 hours, he'd already been arrested, I think, three times that year uh, and released. Uh, but on this, he prepared a statement if he was uh, uh, arrested and not released within 48 hours. Uh, and he wasn't. And eventually he's been in prison. But he said this. Separate me from my wife and children. Ruin my reputation. Destroy my life and my family. The authorities are capable, capable of doing all these things. However, no one in this world can force me to renounce my faith. No one can make me change my life. And no one can raise me from the dead. I'm going to be loyal to Jesus. And he's been imprisoned on false charges. Uh, I think a nine-year prison sentence separated from his wife and family, his church. Loyalty to Jesus. Supreme in my heart. Who would dare to demand such allegiance? Who does Jesus think he is to demand such allegiance? Well, Jesus is worthy of supreme loyalty. He demonstrated unswerving commitment to me and my salvation. Jesus demonstrated unswerving commitment to save us. Even his own life, he was willing to give up for you, for me. He's worthy of supremacy. Uh, of uh, our complete obsession, this Saviour who loved me and gave himself for me. He deserves to be loved, who did this for me. Come to Jesus and come away from those other attachments if they get in the way of devotion and obsession and the supremacy of Jesus in your life. Come to Jesus. If you want to be a disciple, 
uh, and come to him as first uh, and supreme in your affections. But then secondly, come after Jesus. Uh, this is verse 27. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me or come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is uh, telling these people that they must carry the cross and follow him along the Calvary road. That's where Jesus is going. We sometimes think of carrying the cross as some sort of stoic endurance of suffering, affliction, or pain, or trouble. I've got to carry the cross. But in the first century world, carrying a cross was not stoic endurance of some suffering, trouble, or affliction. It was a one-way journey. You carried a cross to your death on it. And that's where Jesus is going. Jesus is on the road to Calvary. Back in chapter 9, after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, uh, chapter 9 and verse 22, Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus says, I'm going to die. And if you want to be my disciple, you've got to carry your cross and die. Die to self. That's what entails for us. We've got to die to self. A.W. Tozer uh, says, among the plastic saints of our time, Jesus has to do all the dying, and all we want to hear is another sermon about his dying. But Jesus says, you've got to carry the cross. You've got to die to self. And there in uh, uh, Luke 9, you've got to do it daily. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, again, remember, he's on the way to uh, Jerusalem, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Luke 9 uh, and verse uh, 51. Uh, Luke 13, the previous chapter, reminds us that Jesus is on that journey. Luke 13 and verse 22. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Uh, verse 33 of uh, Luke 13 in any case, when uh, the people, Herod, the message from Herod about uh, uh, leaving, Luke 13, 33, in any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jesus is going to his death. To pick up your cross and come after me to die. Discipleship is no part-time hobby. It's a call to die, to die to self, your self-interest, uh, uh, your own plans, to die to uh, self. The, uh, the Apostle Paul grasped uh, that. Remember what he says uh, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, uh, as uh, uh, he considers his past life, it's all rubbish now compared to knowing Jesus. Philippians 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Is that part of your aspiration? To become like Jesus in his death. So somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead that's why christ took hold of me that i might not just share in his sufferings but become like him in his death that's the call of discipleship and that's revealed and developed in day-to-day -day little things 
Are you willing to die to yourself in the day-to-day -day humdrum of family life? Will you die to yourself? In the day-to-day -day of work life uh, and the, the inconveniences and the pressure, will you die to self? That's what Jesus calls us to. Who dare demand such self-denial, such self-crucifixion? Who, who can demand that? Well, the one who practiced it more than we can fathom. He took his cross. That's why he came. This second half of Luke's gospel is all about that journey to Jerusalem. He's carrying his cross, as it were, figuratively at this point. He knows he's going to die for us and our salvation. Uh, one of our hymns uh, uh, speaks in this way. Take up your cross, the Saviour said, if you would my disciple be. Deny yourself, forsake the world, and humbly follow after me. Take up your cross, despise the shame, nor let your foolish pride rebel. The Lord for you endured the cross to save your soul from death and hell. Jesus deserves our self-denial because he practiced it to a degree that we can't fathom for us and our salvation. Come to Jesus and turn your back on those other attachments. Come after Jesus to die to self. And then thirdly, count the cost for Jesus. Jesus, uh, as we've seen a number of times in Luke, has a double par uh, parable. Uh, first of all, the one of uh, someone building a tower, a building project. Uh, and if you're going to uh, uh, engage in a building project, well, you've got to sit down and calculate if you can finish it, uh, if you can complete it. Uh, you've got to give careful consideration to it. Uh, some of these uh, programs on the television, Grand Designs, where these people have these extravagant ideas of houses, it always goes over budget, it seems to me, whenever you watch these programs, as, as do other building projects. But you've got to take that into account. Uh, and be willing to give everything to this project. And, uh, similarly with war. Did President Putin really calculate what this war was going to be uh, as he went into Ukraine? He thought he would just be able to uh, do it easily uh, and quickly. No, it's, it's a very different picture now. Did he really count at the cost? Uh, sit down dispassionately. Uh, and give careful consideration uh, and calculation. Discipleship isn't something to rush into thoughtlessly, to be uh, swept up hastily. Something we've got to sit down and think, well, here are these crowds, you see, following Jesus. Well, wait a minute, he's telling them. Stop and think what's involved. Give careful consideration to the demands of discipleship. The uh, Calvin says the taking up these pictures of uh, the building of a tower and uh, the war. Calvin says the advantages of building are found to be sufficient to induce men to spend their substance on it without hesitation, while necessity drives them to shrink from no expense in carrying on war. If you've got uh, these people who have these grand designs. They'll pour everything into it, all their savings. They'll take out mortgages. They'll, they'll, they'll pour everything into this project. War demands total commitment. Verse 33, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. See, discipleship is not just about giving up chocolate during Lent. He who does not give up everything he has cannot be my discipleship. Uh, might be my disciple. Discipleship is difficult, demanding, and dangerous. 
And it may be increasingly so in our present society and culture. We've just thought about what happened in China just uh, five years ago. It may become increasingly challenging, as we've seen in Scotland with Kate Forbes uh, and uh, as we see in the Christian Institute news. It's, it's difficult and demanding and dangerous to stand by Christian truth, to be loyal to Jesus. Are we ready to count the cost? Have we sat down and reckoned with that as followers of Jesus today in our society? It will cost. Have we calculated uh, that cost? Because we've seen people, haven't we? We know people who, it, it was too costly. They turned away from discipleship because they couldn't die to self. They couldn't give up everything uh, that they had. J.C. Ryle, in his book on holiness, uh, that 10 of those have uh, reproduced, has a section on, a chapter on the cost. He says, now let us make the serious inquiry. What does your Christianity cost you? Very likely it costs you nothing. Very probably it neither costs you trouble, nor time, nor thought, nor care, nor pains, nor reading, nor praying, nor self-denial, nor conflict, nor working, nor labour of any kind. Now mark carefully what I say. Such a religion as this will never save your soul. It will never give you peace while you live, nor hope while you die. It will not support you in the day of affliction, nor cheer you in the hour of death. A religion which costs nothing is worth nothing. Awake before it is too late. Awake and repent. Awake and be converted. Awake and believe. Awake and pray. Rest not until you can give a satisfactory answer to my question. What does it cost? But then he says this. If any reader of this message really feels that he has counted the cost and taken up the cross, I bid him persevere and press on. I dare say you often feel your heart faint and are sorely tempted to give up in despair. Your enemies seem so many, your besetting sins so strong, your friends so few, the way so steep and narrow that you hardly know what to do. But still I say persevere and press on. The time is very short. A few more years of watching and praying. A few more tossings on the sea of this world. A few more deaths and changes. A few more winters and summers. And all will be over. We will have fought our last battle and shall need to fight no more. The presence and company of Christ will make amends for all we suffer here below. When we see as we have been seen. And look back on the journey of life. We shall wonder at our own faintness of heart. We shall marvel that we made so much of our cross and thought so little of our crown. We shall marvel that in counting the cost, we could ever doubt on which side the balance of profit lay. Let us take courage. We are not far from home. It may cost much to be a true Christian and a consistent holy person. But it pays. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm going to sing our final hymn. Jesus calls above the tumult of our wild, restless sea. Christian.